Hey, my name is Justin, and this is I'm Listening. On this channel, we host explicit conversations about belief and the stories that shape them. So on today's episode, I'm gonna actually visit a mosque for the very first time to talk to Imam Abdul Karim Hassan. I wanted to get the chance to visit a mosque in person, in part because my last video on Islam. When your very first conversation ever with a Muslim is a self-described queer convert to Islam from Portland, Oregon, there are still a few lingering questions. Sure, I learned a ton from Teresa and honestly have really benefited from our ongoing conversations about faith, but I really do wonder how normative her experience is. Is Islam as open and accommodating as she seems to paint, or could it possibly be that her experience is one of an outlier? So in an attempt to re-educate all my biases and my prejudice that I might have inherited or learned through media, I drove down to Los Angeles to sit in front of a man who literally became a Muslim because of Malcolm X. My grandfather had a church. He was the founder of a church. It was a Methodist church. And my mother didn't like what she heard and what she saw being practiced. So it, it, it discouraged her. She only went back to that church uh, whenever she wanted to socialize uh, with the members, because it was a farming community. So whenever she wanted to socialize with the farming community, the women, that is, she would, she would go to the church and she would take me with her. I was only one of the kids at that time that she would take with her. And uh, I was like six years old and she would give me a penny to donate. And that's where I learned how to give. I learned from, from, from doing, from practice. And I was so anxious to give that penny, uh, I couldn't wait until the, the hostess came by so that I could put it in the tambourine, because they used tambourines in those days. And when I put the penny in the tambourines, I was happy, I was sleepy. I was, I was happy now, now I can go to sleep. <laughs> you know, but you know, six years old, that's what you do. They invited Minister Malcolm there in 1955 to, as a guest speaker. He was the minister in New York. Malcolm came that night, my mother was there, my aunt was there, and so a lot of other people were there at this Morris American meeting, because they were Morris American then. They got so excited about what Malcolm was saying that they, they, they asked the, the sheikh there to invite Malcolm back and they wouldn't. So uh, they, the, those women got together and invited Malcolm back themselves. So they met in a house. And that's when my mother started growing into that idea and that concept. And, and she was the one that took us to the meeting uh, of Malcolm in 1956. And she took uh, eight of us, uh, eight of her children uh, to that meeting. And all of us accepted that message. And there we evolved into uh, the Nation of Islam and then into Universal Islam. The, the, the message back then those days was historical. It wasn't religious, it was history. Okay, so wh wh and, what is he talking about historically? We were talking about slavery. We were talking about the 300 to 250 years that we labored for nothing, for free in the South, and how the, uh, the, the, the the, the slaveholders uh, treated the African uh, with, with, this, uh, with this harshness and raped the women and, and uh, used them whenever they wanted to, take a wife from a man and so forth and so on. So this, it was history that he mostly taught. We accept the history because that history wasn't taught in school. You, you couldn't hear anything about American slavery in school in those days. So he was teaching us something about ourselves and our history that we didn't know. When, when you're sitting through these lessons and he's going through the history, what does that mean to you as a young man? You've, you've never heard these things in school before. How does that impact your way of thinking? Oh, it made me feel better about myself because the, and the, the thinking at that particular time was uh, African-American people were lazy. Uh, they were uh, they, 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 they were uh, uh, robbers and thieves, and, and they, they were worthless, uh, they, 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 they couldn't be you. But whatever they were, the slave master made them that because they denied them education. 
they denied them they, they, the word was freedom, but they denied them the freedom that other Americans were living. And all of those things were pointed out. It, they, had, they, they, they had a system called separate but equal education. And when I first started the school in the South, there, there was no equal in education. It was, uh, we used to walk to school two miles and a bus would come by carrying uh, the European children and, and they were just making fun at us and stuff like that as we was on our way to school. So it wasn't anything justified, just, just uh, anything that was just and, and, and fair in that particular society. And the, and the educators and the government and the politician people kept all that hid. They wouldn't put it in books, they wouldn't put it in, uh, on, on, in the newspaper. The only thing that we would see that made us feel bad, even worse, was this uh, white man flying through the jungle by the name of Tarzan, scaring all of the African natives. And they called him the Lord of the Jungle. We were so messed up in the head that, 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 we, that we plotted for, for Tarzan. We were with Tarzan rather than with the, the natives of, of, of so-called Africa. And that type of history made us look like uh, that we were uh, nothing and nobody. One history book I read in the seventh grade, it wasn't a history book, it was just a geography book that said that the Africans contributed less to civilization than any other people on earth. That made you feel worse. And then that book was loaded with words like savages and all of that, and we're descendants from those people. So those kind of things Malcolm was breaking down those kind of things to us and showing us what their intent was to keep us dumb to our own history so that uh, we will always be uh, the last, last hired, the first fired. And kept us so poor that we had to find relief in cigarettes, alcohol, wine, and drugs. This was ghetto life. So we had to be reformed. So the life of that day, uh, as Malcolm's teacher, Elijah Muhammad used to say, that we were deaf, dumb, and blind, we had to be reformed. We were dying early, we didn't live a, a, a long life, we didn't live a happy life, we didn't have a peaceful life, so we had to be reformed. So his job, his message was to reform us from that kind of condition, put us on two feet and stop depending upon welfare from uh, all the crumbs falling off the white man's table. I find it so interesting that the thing that drove Imam Hassan to Islam is also Western Christianity's most significant blemish over the last few centuries. I'm also going to guess that his experience, Imam Hassan's experience, is not a unique one and that many other people have felt this way as well. When a religion is weaponized against your entire community, there are going to be repercussions. When life and liberty are held out of arm's reach and your people are brutalized, raped, and dehumanized, it only makes sense that you're going to to reject the foundation that was used to justify these actions. In other words, I think that I can actually sympathize with Imam Hassan's experience. I can understand how liberating Malcolm X's message must have felt to him when he first heard it. So first of all, we began to, we, we began to save our money by what? Stop smoking? And this was in the, the, the this was, it started in the 30s, but stop smoking, stop drinking, stop gambling, stop using drugs, to stop all of those nonsensical things that were destroying us and start saving our money. Because cigarettes didn't cost that much, but in those days, that was a lot. We could use that to buy food. We could use that to buy clothes. We could use that to provide better shelter. So that kind of idea uh, resonated with me because uh, uh, I didn't know this. That wasn't taught in school. And I was not a traveler, so I have not seen it any other place. But uh, when, so when I started really looking around in the neighborhood where we lived, I saw what he was talking about. For the first time, my eyes were open to it. And once my eyes got open to it, I said, I need to help, help uh, Malcolm and uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad reform the African-American people so they can do something for self and get out of this kind of condition. 
So you're compelled by this message. You're really enthralled by the work that Malcolm and you said Elijah, is that correct? Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad were doing together. When, when does when does spirituality, when does religion come into play? Or uh, You said initially it was about reforming your community, but obviously we're here today sitting in the shadow of, of your soon to be completed mosque. When, when does Islam kind of come into the picture for you? Well, I'll tell you, it started at the beginning, but only in name. This man came from Pakistan. For no, Pakistan wasn't a, a, a country then. Came from uh, India. His name was Mr. W. D. Farad. He taught the Abu Elijah Muhammad, and the Abu Elijah Muhammad taught us and Malcolm and all the rest of us. And he taught him that we came from Africa and we were Muslims. Many of us were Muslims when we came here, and that's true. That's true history. I found out after Malcolm that those things were true. Said we were Muslims then. And that as Muslims, we didn't smoke, we didn't drink, we didn't do all these crazy, crazy things as Muslims. So we had that. That was part of the Reformation. And that as Muslims, we should live a better life. We die too young and, and we die sick and, and, uh, and we die from diseases a lot. So when he, ch he, when he taught the, the, ab the abstinence from from, from alcohol and, and gambling and, and cigarettes and, and, and uh, cigars and all of those particular things. He, he, he claimed that we didn't do that when we was in Africa. But under the control of the Europeans during slavery time, all of those things were forced upon us. We picked tobacco, we grew it. We picked cotton, we grew that. Or we didn't grow it, but we planted it. Uh, tobacco and we planted cotton and then we harvested and then we began to smoke the leaves. But so, so this message was a returning back to your roots, which yeah, back yes. You're saying that you were you were you were never taught what your roots were, and so now you're having this kind of holistic approach of not just where did you come from and here's the facts and the history, but this is an entire way of life, a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world around you. Yeah, that's right. So he painted a beautiful picture of it. So we believe that. And, and we began to, to teach the people and the ghetto that, that same message. Yeah, I'm curious how people responded to the idea of, one, you're forming an entire community's way of life, but now you're also touching, you know, kind of a, a personal and deeply held belief like religion. Uh, I'm guessing the community that you grew up in was largely a Christian community, and now there's this other religion coming? How did people respond when you started to try and reform, but also teach this new way of life, this new religion, this new way of thinking? Well, they were, they were, they, he, they were, they did not know that they had that religion before they left Africa. They did not know that. So they were forced into this other belief, Christianity. And not, not made to go into Christianity, but they would go to their churches and only the house African-American could go to the church with them, but not go inside. It was, they would listen at the window to what they were saying. So they, they, they're preaching, you know, freedom, justice, and equality, and all of that through the, through the church message. But they're outside at the same time. Hand. But um, among the, the slaves, there was no such thing. So they thought that if they got into that, they would receive the same kind of fairness and justice that, that, they would, that the Europeans were receiving. And they found out too late that it wasn't Not so. Not the case. So, so, so as people are embracing Islam, does equality kind of come with it? Do we see a, a shift in that, that perspective as well? Yes. Equality came with it, plus... Plus... Uh, A way of life, a way of life that differed from the way of life that our Christian African Americans were living. We were taught what to eat and how to eat it. And, and it was pointed out to us in the Bible that the pig, the hog, unclean, was not <laughs> right. That you, it was so nasty and dirty that you shouldn't even put your hands on it. Right? Yep. So Muslims, you know. No, no more bacon or, or. No, no, no. No more bacon, <laughs> chitlins. The barbecue and all looks that. a little different yeah. now. So those people that were used to that couldn't see them 
eliminating that out of that diet like we eliminated out of our diet. And but the the, the the longer that they watched us and the faster that we grew, they began to change their minds slightly. And as they began to change their nine their minds, they all came to the meetings to listen and hear more of what we have to say because it was historical and it was something new and they had not heard it before. But they still had that picture of a, a false image of Christ on the wall. You know, and we all know that that's what, what Christ looked like. We all know that. I have some, some friends, I visited a, a black church on the East Coast and they jokingly called it Jesse Christ instead of Jesus Christ because it's the white man's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that that was kind of clever. Well, yeah, that was, a, that, that was the thing because Jesus didn't mean justice for them. Uh, Jesus only meant obey your master. And that's what they taught during the slavery time. Uh, yeah, well, as they, as some, some of the slaves got educated in that faith, they were, they were told by the slave owners to teach that part of the Bible to the other slaves. Servants, obey your master. And since they were the master and we were the servants, we had to, we had to have complete ob obedience to them. So, so uh, I mean, obviously that Islam taught, touches on every aspect of life, I would presumably. What, what does Islam have to say about this idea, the servants obeying your masters? What was the message uh, from Islam regarding slavery? thought that it was the white man's religion. Oh, it was just as simple as that? It's yeah, just it just, uh, Christianity is the white man's religion. Christianity was, 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 uh, uh, was, was, was organized by white people. Christianity was, uh, uh, was spread over the world by white people. Chris, and, they were, they, and they forced a lot of people, white people, take the Spanish, for instance, who, who came on the West Coast and, and entered into South America. The conquistadores, as they call them. They, and, and, and especially in California. In California, they forced the, the natives into slavery and they forced them to, uh, to submit to, that, to the Christianity uh, that, that they were taught because they brought the padres with them and the soldiers. The soldiers would kill the, rebe the, the, the rebellious ones and the padres would convert the other ones. But that was not what they believed. That was what was forced upon them. So then they became a part of that because of force, not because of willing, like they used to teach in the church, say, let come all who will. But the African-American didn't will to come anywhere. He was forced to go wherever he went and so the, were the natives. In a recent AMA on Instagram, someone asked me what I thought the biggest problem with modern Christianity was, and my response was an unhealthy infatuation with power. It seems as though that the ones who, and I'm going to use air quotes here, proclaim Christianity are the ones fighting for power the most. They're the ones most likely to attempt to legislate their beliefs and attempt to force others to live accordingly, which in my opinion is completely backwards. The narrative of scripture, as far as I can see, is a God who values freedom of conscience more than literally anything else. Instead of holding on to power, he humbles himself and just gives it away. And when I was listening to Imam Hassan's story and just observing right now what's happening in America around us, I can't help but notice the disconnect. The unfortunate reality is that force and Christianity have historically gone hand in hand more often than not. And what's becoming more clear to me is that the fruit of this is rotten in your growth and your transition, you're going away from what you were raised in to this new way of thinking. Um, w was there a backlash from, you, you said that your, your father was a minister? No, my grandfather. Oh, sorry, your grandfather was a minister. How did grandpa feel about this? Oh, gra grandfather was dead then. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, but my father. Your father. Didn't have no position. He told me when I heard Malcolm and I accepted, he told me, he said, son, he said, let me tell you something. I don't care what you believe. What you believe is your choice. Can't nobody make you believe this or believe that. But if you believe it, be a good one. That's all he told me. Be a good one, what you believe. He never joined anything. He was, uh, but my mother was a joiner. And my mother uh, also preached that particular message to us uh, every day in between. Uh, the, the going to the, what we call the temples at that time, and going to the temples, because the temple was a place to teach people, wasn't a place to pray. 
It was a place to be taught. So we had to learn about it before we could preach it. You know, you just don't come into a new religion and start doing what people have been doing for five, six, seven years or even longer. You have to be taught. You have to be taught the rituals of it. And uh, so until we learned the rituals of it, they learned gradually and they became uh, uh, yeah. members. Sorry, I didn't, mean, I didn't mean to cut you off. From what you're learning, what was difficult uh, as you're learning these new things, these rituals, these new beliefs, what was challenging about that? It wasn't difficult to me, for me. It wasn't difficult at all. I look forward to the next, to the next meeting and to the next talk and to the next message and to the next, next training. Is, I look it, is forward this because to you're it. just seeing it benefit your, every time you apply something, it just makes your life better? Why are you looking forward to it so much? Well, look, I have been eating pork because I didn't know any better. I had been smoking, I had been drinking, I had been going to these different clubs and dancing and all that other stuff. I never used drugs, but going to these different clubs and all of that. So when I first heard Malcolm, I found out that what I was doing was the killing me and keeping me poor because we wasted, rather than to spend the money on something that's useful and beneficial, we were spending something on something that is, is robbing me of my, of, of my funds. Look, my brother owned a grocery store. I was 12 years old, I used to work in the grocery store. People come in, they didn't have enough money to buy a pack of cigarettes. And we used to try to talk them out of it buying it. They wanted to buy just one, one cigarette out of the pack, and which was illegal. But my brother, he didn't believe, he, he, didn't, he was different. He said, he said, open the pack, you put it under the counter, and sell them one cigarette. So we sold one cigarette for a penny. So a pack of cigarettes was selling for, for, for 10 cents, and I could get 20 cents out of the pack if I sold them uh, singly. So that's the, way he, that was, that's the way he thought. But I was doing all of those things before I came into the community. But then when I came in and I heard all those good messages about uh, what we should do and what we should not be doing in order to uh, in order to be a, 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 a real human being and, and living a, a good life, I quit all those things. And when I quit all those things, I never went back to it. In fact, we brought more people in to listen. I brought a lot of my friends to the meeting. They didn't accept it. Yeah, because that's one of my questions. Like, I feel like the way that you responded to the message is probably unique because I think of how most of my friends react to something like Christianity where, you know, part of the message includes, you know, don't do drugs and alcohol, don't do all these things that I think using your words are a kind of stealing life away from you. There's these things that are, aren't like going to lead you to your happiest or most most fulfilled life and yet a lot of my friends they're like nah like we, we don't want that it's it's oppressive it's restrictive it's whatever the case is. i find true joy in what i'm doing right now i feel like it's it truly leads to a happier life but a lot of my friends they don't seem to be very interested in religion because it feels restrictive well we weren't discouraged by that we were not discouraged by that because where you find 10 or 20 people that won't you that we have other hundreds of people that you don't know. We had a program. We would put our message on paper, newspaper. The first paper that we sold was a Pittsburgh Courier. It had an article in there by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In 1956, the paper came out in June, 1956. We used to sell the Pittsburgh Courier with his column in it. We used to go from door to door we had we 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 I, I went into the projects where the poor people were the poor people that needed this message i went into the project cell, and you know the more papers we sold the more people read that article the more they began to think and that's what you want people to do you want them to think you want them to think you want them to, to, to develop their intellect and once they think and once they started depend upon their intellect and they start weighing what is good and what is bad then they will change themselves. We can't force anybody to change, and that's good. We let people come on their own, their, 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 on, on, on their own, own free will. And once they come on their own free will, they're solid, like me. Nobody forced me, nobody intimidated me. My mother didn't put pressure on me either. She, I just, she just took me to the meeting, and when she did, that was it. And that's what most of the African Americans were. It was, they were hard at first, 
But it got easier and easier because more men and women started coming. Now the women was another issue too because they didn't like the long dresses. They, the dresses were getting shorter and shorter all the time. And the women in, 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 in Islam and the temple, their dresses were getting longer and longer all the time. And they weren't using straight, straightening combs on their hair and they wore scarves on their head. They didn't wear veils, but they wore scarves on their head. And they didn't go naked out there in the street. And that was a problem too with some women. They thought that if, if they were just put on a blouse that is loose hanging and they could show all their, their, their breasts, that, you know, that was attractive and it was attractive. <laughs> and, and, and it was the right thing to do. But the ones that came and listened to the message they began to see that this was not the right way to do it if you want to be respectful. Because those women were not respected. And the same thing is happening today. But back in those days, it was very hard to do because we only had one, one, one uh, uh, method to get to them. That's to knock on their door, sell them the newspaper, and when they got interest in it, then they would come and listen to the teaching. We didn't, we didn't talk about the dress at first. Because that was that's probably wise. I don't think you're going to get many women to come <laughs> well, in if no, you that's, that's what true. you're talking about first. That's true. We didn't talk about the, the, the thing that was destroying them at first. We, 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 we uh, gradually, gradually talked about it. And as the, the more they learned and the more they, they, they saw what other women were doing, then they began to gradually change themselves. And as they, and as, oh, excuse me. And as that's they, right. You're getting excited and I love it. That's all right. <laughs> And as they gradually changed, they brought in more people. They would bring people in. We call it fishing. It's like like Paul, like uh, not Paul, but uh, uh, like Peter, or Peter, sure. like Peter. See, Peter's job was he, Peter was a fisherman, so he would bring in the fish. So that's what we call what we were doing fishing. Instead of fishing for fish, we were fishing for the the myth that he did the deaf, dumb, and blind, and the African-Americans that still was living the life that was destroying them. How has, how has Islam really made a difference in your life? Oh, it makes a world of difference to myself, to my life. I learned how to pray. You know, I learned that there was one God. I learned how to pray. I learned how to, how to be even more charitable. I learned how to how to how to how to how to fast, save food, and I and and basically I learned that the most important thing after faith is helping people. Helping people. That's what I learned in Islam, is helping people, and and be thankful to people. I also learned that if you're not thankful to people, you're not thankful to God, because that one God is the creator of all people. And he didn't, he didn't create this separation. This separation was created by people. So it's artificial. It's not real. It's not part of their nature. It's not their nature to be that. It's not their nature to be a slave or to be a slave master. And, in the, and the originally, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the people in Arabia, uh, they had slaves too. But then when Islam came to them, they learned that uh, slavery that you should only be slaves to, to, to one, and that was to God himself, not to another man. You mentioned how the divisions that exist are artificial, and I, that's something that I firmly believe. It, one, of the, one of the main reasons why I'm here is because I see uh, so much manufactured division between you know, my faith and, and your faith, potentially, and I'm just curious, how do you see how you relate to or you want your community or you want Islam to relate to, whether that's the atheist out there, that's the Christian out there, or people who aren't Muslim, how do you see, how would you hope for us to interact with people kind of crossing the aisle, so to speak? We don't have a problem with that. We don't have a problem with being with being helpful and useful and friendly to, to any human being. In the beginning, and all of faith believe this, in the beginning, we all came, we are the children of Adam. And if we are the children of Adam, we're kin. We're kin folks. We're just like cousins and, and second cousins and third cousins, but we're all kin. So as a kin, we're told in our, in our faith in the Quran that we should help and be neighborly 
to whoever lives next to you, whoever that is, whether it's a Muslim or non-Muslim. We have to be neighborly toward them and helpful toward them. Also, with religious people, the Quran says that if that the, the churches, the synagogues, the, the Sabians place of worship, and the Muslims are houses of worship for God, and that we should not we should we should not vandalize the church. And if we see somebody vandalizing the church, we are told that we should help stop that. You can't vandalize the synagogue. If we see somebody vandalizing, we got to stop that because those places were built with the idea of the worship of one God. And since they were built for that work, we're destroying a house of worship. And you'd rather live, you'd rather have a house of worship than a house of non-worship because at least they have some kind of control. All we ask among them is that, you, that if you are a Christian, live the Christian life like it's supposed to be lived. Like, like, like your father said, if you're going to be a Muslim, be a good one. Be a if you're going to be one. a Christian, be a good one. Exactly. If you're going to be a whatever. Be a, be a good one. Don't be a phony. Don't be a, 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 a mass marvel. You got the mask on today and tonight you are a, 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 a robber of, of a grocery store, a robber of some innocent man coming home uh, from work with the money in his pocket and taking it. Don't be that way. If you are a Jew, be a good Jew. Be, be the good Jew that you started out to be when you was a child. Because all children are innocent. All are innocent. None of them are guilty of anything. You're not born criminals, and you're not born with any sin, like some of y'all teach. You're not, <laughs> you can't, it's unfair, in our opinion, to blame the, blame the son for what the father did. Sure. The blind man, for instance, it's a good story. You know that story? Blind man Bartimaeus. Yeah, the blind man, they asked Christ. So, who sinned? Was it him or his parents? Yeah, it said, who sinned? Did, did, did you sin? He said, he said no, he, he did not sin. This man did not sin. He said, if the parents sin, you got to blame the parents. You can't blame the child. So there is no guilt in a child. A child is innocent from birth. And another thing that the blind man said that was important, when, when, when Christ put that uh, uh spitting water on his eyes, and he began to see things. He said, Christ asked him, said, what do you see? He said, I see trees. He, no, I see men as trees. And then he put that same thing on his eye, and he said, what do you see? I see men as they are. Now, if you're going to be that, be that. Christ was a, look, you know, if people followed what Christ said, they would be good Christians. But I live, I got Christian relatives. They don't follow what Christ say. They follow what they say. And they're in the clubs and they're in the bars and they, they, they drink wine, they drink whiskey, they, 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 uh, 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 they do all the crazy stuff that's out there. That's not being a good Christian. That's being a bad Christian. So that needs to change. If Jews do that, they need to change. Their religion don't teach that. And we got a good idea, a good knowledge of what religion teaches. The Quran is full of what religion teaches. So you have to be whatever it is that you say you're going to be, as my father said, be a good one. We can live together in peace. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because Christ was a peaceful man. How are the Christians going to make all these guns and kill people? That's not being Christ-like. That being shaitan-like, if you know what that word means. That being shaitan-like. That's not being Christ-like. Christ was a peaceful man. You never see anything in there that, that, that says he's anything other than that. So if you will call yourself after that, then you should be that. And don't be a hypocrite to it. Don't be a hypocrite. No matter your religion, creed, or dogma, I think that this is something that we can all agree on. Whatever you're going to be, be a good one. After this conversation, I had the opportunity to ask Imam Hassan a handful of questions that were a little bit more pointed. Like how does Islam respond to LGBT people, for example? 
But that question and answer session will come in our next episode. If you would like early access to the Q&A session, or if you'd like to see the full unedited version of this interview, you can do so over at patreon.com slash In fact, there's a whole host of bonus episodes and unaired interviews available for our patrons as a thank you for supporting this channel. Again, that's patreon.com slash